I don't ever remember flies being as bad as they are this summer. I'm guessing it's because the chicken coop on the other side of the yard is drawing them in from miles away since it's filled with chicken turds, which Flint lovingly calls yard popcorn. Well, lots of those flies are finding their way into the shop, so I picked up one of these electric fly swatters to deal with them. But obviously, this fly swatter just isn't fancy enough for my shop, so I had to make one out of some unnecessary walnut. I started out by taking apart the store-bought fly swatter so I could cannibalize the electronic components. This actually came in a two-pack, which gave me a safety blanket, just in case I messed one up. From the start, I was planning to use my X-Carve to cut out the nice walnut pieces to replace this cheap plastic stuff. But that presents an interesting challenge. How do you make a digital version of a real-world object and have the parts fit together? With straight lines, that's easy, but I'm not about to try and measure those curves. I'm just not that clever. Instead, I just took a picture and measured the overall length and width of the components that I was trying to fit, then imported that photo into Adobe Illustrator. I realize not everybody has this program, but the process is the same regardless of what software you use. There are a few ways to turn this photo into a file that the XCarve can use. The first one is to use Image Trace, which will essentially use the contrast in the photo to outline the shapes inside it. It can work really well, but with more complex images, you end up with all sorts of extra artifacts that you have to clean out. I'll usually use this method if the object I'm copying is asymmetrical, but in this case, I need the left and right side of the racket to be a perfect mirror of each other. So let's step back and try this a different way. Starting at the top center, I use the pen tool, or in Photoshop, I would use the polygonal lasso. Then I hold shift, which forces me to draw a perfectly vertical line all the way to the bottom. From here, I just start dropping points as I trace the outline of the shape. I realize I'm drawing straight line segments around a curved shape, so I drop points more frequently around sharp corners to keep the overall shape looking curved and less like something out of Minecraft. Once I complete the shape, I copy it and flip it horizontally. Then I drag the new half to line up with the other edge. Again, shift is your friend here because it forces the move to only happen in one plane. It will not move up or down at all. I also change the color because it makes it easier to distinguish my shape from the white in the photo, and dropping the opacity allows me to see through it so I can get it lined up perfectly. Once the shapes are in line, I combine them using the Pathfinder panel. Again, different programs will have a way to do this, it's just called something else. Finally, I input the overall length and width that I measured earlier to get my drawing to scale in one complete and perfectly symmetrical shape. Now that I had my shape, I could play with the outline to create the carve file that I would use an easel to actually cut this thing out of walnut. All right, we're ready to start carving this thing out. Now the piece of wood that I picked for this is only barely wide enough to actually get the whole head out of it. And the only reason it's wide enough is because of the two sort of bulbs on this side of the piece of wood. To make sure that it all actually got on place here, since I don't have any straight lines to reference off of, I put both of the tips of the bulbs on this line on the board, so they are perfectly straight in line. And then I referenced in easel the, the shapes are off of this point and this point. And I measured up from the bottom corner to the widest part of this bulb and placed the first racket head in there in easel. Uh, when I zero the tool, I'll zero it off of the surface of the board, but then I will come over here to where this line and this line intersect. And I tried this once already, and then I did an air pass, which is where you actually just set your depth too shallow to cut anything, and I let it run around the perimeter of it once. And the blade, of the, or the bit of the router, came to the edge and actually passed out the other side, but not completely. Some of it was still inside the wood, so I'm making the absolute most of this piece of material, and it's going to work. That weird little shape at the bottom really messed up my brain right from the start. In a practice piece that I didn't want to show you guys, I completely cut that out which left an ugly hole all the way through the racket. In this final piece, I overcompensated and cut none of it out, which would have blocked all the components from fitting in. I caught myself before removing the board from the bed of the X-Carve and fixed the problem by drawing a box over that space and cutting it to the same depth as the rest of the recess. With that over, my brain could start healing itself. I 
had the foresight to put in holes for locator pins to keep both halves aligned with each other. When I put the pieces together for the first time, I was thrilled to see that it all lined up according to plan. Switching gears to the handle now, this is the one place where I would do things differently if I was starting over again. The racket I started with had an on-off switch in addition to the little button you hold to apply power to the wire mesh. I'm pretty sure this is why there's an entire circuit board involved where I expected to find only about three wires. If I were starting over, I would find a simpler racket that would allow me to make a smaller handle. As it is, I decided the best way to keep all the scary electronics in order was to bury the mount for the circuit board into the handle. I trimmed it down as much as I could, but that still left me a bit larger than I would have liked. The handle comes together the same way, just two halves clamped together around the electronics. Since this was just straight lines, I was able to make the drawing for measurements alone and didn't have to mess with pictures or tracing. I carefully separated the two halves at the bandsaw, then jointed that edge. Then, with the parts pinned together, I cut off the rough edge on the table saw. I cut the handle to length at the miter saw, then used my bandsaw and a disc sander to add an angle to make the transition from head to handle a little less chunky. I needed to be able to replace the batteries in this thing, so I cut a hole through the back, then added an oversized recess that a cap could fit into. I added a round over to all the corners, then spent a ton of time hand sanding to make everything perfect before adding finish to the outside. I drilled a small hole in the side of the handle for the power button, and one in the face that would line up with the LED power indicator light. I put all the components together inside the frame and reconnected the wires that I snipped earlier to keep from accidentally ripping the wires off the circuit board. Pro tip, make sure you put your heat shrink tubing on the wires before you solder them together. I have a butane powered, meaning it's a cordless soldering iron that I love, but you do have to keep an eye on the exhaust. Watch the red side heat tubing shrink on me while I'm working on the neutral wires. With the tip removed, the iron works to shrink the tubing in a more intentional way. I finished assembling the racket and taped it together, then installed some batteries so I could take it for a test drive. Here's a trick that I used to see if an electric fence is on or not. Take a nice green blade of grass and touch it to the wire. If it's hot, you'll feel a little tingle in your fingertips. In this case, it completes the circuit and you get a nice loud pop and a blue spark. Looks like everything is in working order. I needed to make one last modification. To make a shoulder so my power button could be pushed in, but not slide out. I used a Forstner bit to remove most of the material, then squared up the corners with a small chisel. I decided I wanted a more durable finish since this thing might get abused a bit, so I put on several coats of spray-on poly. Then when that dried, I finally glued the whole thing together for the last time. I was very careful to get glue on all the mating surfaces, but not to use too much. I wiped up any extra glue that squeezed out onto my finish, and used clamps all the way around to get a good, solid bond. With the head done, I glued the handle the same way. Strategically slather glue, carefully install the electronics, and press the pieces together. I kept glue far away from the power button because it might be impossible to fix that if it gets bound up. I considered adding pins between the handle and the head to keep them from ever separating, but this thing just won't ever see enough force to cause that to happen. If I was building a tennis racket, that would be a different story. I used some small chunks of a clean old t-shirt as pads to keep the clamps from marring the finish. Then I just had to wait for the glue to dry before I could test it out on some unsuspecting flies. I realize that this is a pretty silly project, but it definitely presented me with some challenges, and a good challenge is always going to make you smarter, and that's why I like this one. Not to mention the world could always use a little bit more unnecessary walnut in it. Huge thank you to Inventables for their support with this project. Go check them out. There's a link down in the description for that. And there's also links for all the cool tools and materials that I used in this project. So check those out. Uh, I also would like to apologize for all the cricket noises. I tried to hide them in the videos as much as I could, but there has been an infestation. And now I'm gonna have to come up with some kind of electric cricket bat. Oh, there's a thing. Uh, but boy, that's about it. So thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.